My name is Ed Finkler. I work for a company called Fictive Kin, and uh, this is a talk uh, called "More Code, More Problems." And I, it, it sort of came out of a thing when um, a couple of years ago was it that long ago? A couple of years ago, I was doing. Uh, I was sort of getting at the end of my rope, um, particularly in the PHP community. How many of you guys work in PHP? Like, do a lot of PHP work. So, so fair number. Um, so, if you're familiar with the PHP. Uh, sort of, I guess, ecosystem. Um, there's a lot of like full stack framework stuff out there. There's literally just like dozens and dozens and dozens of choices. And um, for one reason or another, there, for uh, you know a lot of reasons, um, there aren't a lot of sort of like single use reusable libraries. And I was frustrated by that. And uh, especially when I would say jump and do some stuff in Node, or I would do some things in Python, or something like that, and they had really nice sort of package management stuff, and uh, a lot of just I guess you'd call utility libraries as opposed to big frameworks that had a bunch of stuff all thrown into one. And um, in building large applications in PHP and things that had to scale up and stuff like that, it's uh, it became frustrating because we'd have to bring in large amounts of code to get like certain functionality. Um, we had uh, certain things that, you know, we had to pull in like a huge full stack framework just to get really just one piece of something. And that isn't really, that wasn't exciting. Um, and I, so I wrote up this thing called the Micro PHP Manifesto. And um, that talked about it, sort of had some basic concepts that I thought about is like that the idea that you essentially, you, it's better to have more, have less code than more, right? And, uh, but in general, after talking with a few people about it, I realized that this is pretty applicable to lots of different languages. And that you see these kinds of things. Uh, maybe it's more prominent in PHP than some other, say, interpreted languages that people use, but it's still pretty common uh, for people to write big stuff. And, 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 uh, and I, so I, I, I reworked basically that talk and that, that, that idea into these uh, sort of set of principles that I've got um, that I try to follow to try to make me more, uh, like I think, a better programmer, stuff like that. So I'm going to get into that and just start off with number one here. And the first thing that I do is that I, I try to focus on learning languages and not frameworks. Um, now I like uh, PHP, although a little less lately. And I like Python, and I like JavaScript. And I like making things in those languages, of PHP and Python and JavaScript. I like making web stuff, and I like things that work on the web and stuff like that. Um, but although I use these tools sometimes, I'm not a jQuery developer. And I'm not, say, a Symfony developer or a Zen framework developer. I'm not a Django developer. Um, I, I'm a developer in, in those kinds of, th in, in, in these languages, not these frameworks. I think they're all uh, valuable and useful tools in many situations. I use jQuery all the time, um, for example. Um, and uh, I've, used, uh, I've used Zen for stuff. I've used other kinds of full stack frameworks in other situations. But I think the thing that you get into, and I often see this particularly with people who are, say, just learning how to get into coding or just learning how to get into a particular language. Um, I think the problem that you get into is that if you only know how to use one framework, uh, I think your options for using the right tool for the job are, get pretty limited. And I think if all that I know are those tools, my options get limited, uh, particularly if like flexibility and performance are a big concern. Um, one of the things that I think you see a lot of times is that uh, when you have, uh, when you have, say, a large stack framework that's gotten a lot of popularity, you'll still pe see people starting to just building on top of that to do stuff that um, it wasn't necessarily meant to do. Like, um, I, I've seen some, we had some experience with, uh, there's a Django add-on that does RESTful, um, that, that sort of makes a RESTful kind of API stuff out of it. Um, and it, that works pretty well for, for that kind of stuff, but we ran into tons of performance problems with it and basically had to rip it out and redo the whole thing because of the way that it worked. Um, I think that's a common problem you run into. Um, I think that my experience has been that I become a better and a more versatile programmer when I focus on learning a language first. So uh, when I'm learning a framework first, I think that tends to kind of lead to a sort of a plug and pray approach. Um, and I guess you, you kind of call hammer nail scenarios where uh, 
you you know if you you only have one hammer now everything else looks like a nail or you you only have you know if all you've got is that hammer um and i think that personally i'd rather spend time learning about more about the language itself and learning about like small ways that people solve problems with the language itself knowing that the skills that i learned they're going to be able to apply to anything that i build in in the in the future um i think it's a common thing that you see with uh if you've learned, say, common, like in PHP, uh, we'll see, I'd say probably the, the two top deployed things, and I don't know, these might be the two top like deployed, if you call them platforms, uh, on the web, say WordPress and Drupal. Um, it typically what happens is that uh, p people may not even be really coders with them, but they, uh, they learn, even if they are developers, if they're working in this kind of a, if the, the, all they know is WordPress, or all they know is Drupal, what they'll tend to do is they'll look for, say, a plugin that solves their problem. And that's fine, and that's the ending. And a lot of times that can, bring, uh, that, that can bring you up to speed pretty quickly. But their knowledge of how that stuff works and um, the potential downsides to what you, know, uh, what you might be doing by bringing stuff in gets to be problematic. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, I also think that the complexity of full stack frameworks is hard, um, particularly if you don't already have a decent feel for the language itself. A lot of times they're very complex architectures and nomenclatures that go along with it. Um, and, uh, and those things you often don't carry over to other frameworks or other tools or things like that. Um, and I think that's problematic, and again, back to that idea of diversity, or if you, say, build an application and find yourself needing to scale that up to a, certain, to a higher level, uh, you might run into a problem if you, if you can't transition to something else, or you can't pull a piece of that out and say, I need to rework that in a different tool, um, or either I build myself or I build with a different, uh, you know, different available pieces that I've got. I think the second thing, second principle that I like is, is building small things. And I like small things. I like small stuff. I think it's good. Um, it's easier to understand and it's harder to screw up. I uh, have a, one of the things that <laughs> I always feel I'm kind of embarrassed about, but um, I think uh, I always like to read beginner documentation for stuff, even though I feel like, I mean, I've been doing web development for 16 years now, um, I always like to read the, be the absolute beginner stuff because I sort of have to start at a small level and take little bites and, and get a little bigger and a little more knowledge and a little more knowledge. And I like to see it broken down as, as much as possible. And so I find it, I always find it really overwhelming to get sort of tossed into a very large complex system that tries to solve as many problems as possible. And that's what ha tends to happen with full stack frameworks as they try to gain popularity and more and more people add more stuff into it to solve their own problems and it tries to kind of become everything to everybody. I think smaller things, like I said, they're easier for me to understand. And it's harder for, uh, it's just harder to screw stuff up because there's just less stuff going on. Um, I think that it's really important to try to build small things with simple purposes. And don't try to make a single module or piece or whatever, however you want to divide up your code and, and, and think about that. Don't try to make it do too much. Try to solve single problems as much as you can uh, with self-contained pieces that solve individual problems as best you can, again. Um, and those are going to work together, and they're going to solve bigger problems. Um, I think each piece should work together with other pieces to accomplish bigger things. Um, fixing bugs is easier because you can look at an individual piece and see what's going on. And I think that verifying code or testing that code is a lot easier because it's smaller and more modular. And you can, uh, again, much more easily do testing and that kind of thing. Does anybody have any questions at this point, comments, whatever? Okay. The third thing is really uh, that I think less code is better than more. Uh, and that's really where this comes from, is, is a paraphrase of Biggie Small, more code, more problems. Um, I think that it's important that you're able to, you have to manage less code, and you know, trying to manage less code. I think that bigger code bases get harder to manage. I think greps take longer. Um, I've, had, I've had to do a lot of work when I've been doing consulting, where I essentially had to, 
sort of, not reverse engineer, but I come into a code base that's an existing large code base, and I don't really have an understanding for how it works, and I have to come in and try to fix a problem, or I have to do, like, say, some kind of security assessment on it or something like that. And um, so I've gotten pretty good at figuring out how, like, uh, the techniques for like how to how to figure out how a code base works. How did I you know why is this page generating this way and where does this variable come from and where does this stuff come from? Um, I think that navigating th through like things like complex file structures tends to take longer. Um, I I think that the the you know just the more code you've got again it, it just takes longer to kind of search through that. Um, I think that tracing execution through bunches of files is really hard. Um, that's a common thing that I'll see. Uh, particularly it, with PHP stuff, is that you'll see stuff divided into, um, and for the effort of sort of organizational purposes, they'll uh, divide stuff up into bunches of different files, but you'll see execution happen across, say, you know, 10 or 20 files, and it's really hard to kind of trace that through and say, draw, okay, we're going from here to here to here to here. Um, and I think that keeping that all straight in your brain gets challenging. Um, I think that... Uh, there's this idea uh, that I've heard talked about that you sort of have a, you know, a buffer of information that you can keep in your brain, and I think that varies for people. But I think mine is pretty small, <laughs> and um, I think that what I found is that just just the literally the longer and more code that I've got to look at on a screen, and I I find myself that I start getting overwhelmed with it, that it's hard for me to keep track of it. Um, part of that is just visually I find that hard to do. And then um, it's just hard to keep straight in my head sort of all the stuff that's going on. Um, it kind of overflows that brain buffer that I have. So that you know, code management, but also supporting less code. Um, I think if your app is using it, you have to support it. And that's a really key thing, um, that every line of code that your application is using um, you have to support that. You have to support that in the sense that if bugs come out, you need to be aware, or, or you say bug reports or things like that, you need to be aware of that. Or if you, if you ID a bug, you need to be responsible for taking care of that. If there's security issues that come up, you have to keep on top of that stuff. Um, I, but I see that all the time where um, I see installs of things like, say, WordPress that just sit there and don't do anything. And they don't see, either they don't upgrade core WordPress or they don't upgrade, say, plugins they've installed uh, for stuff. And um, those things, it's, it's not a matter of if, but when those things are going to get exploited. Um, it, so, and supporting that isn't just a matter of, like, say, security and uh, you know, bugs and stuff like that. But I think also if you think about working as a team and working with other people and considering that other people might be interacting with your code down the road, I think if you imagine yourself explaining how your code works to another developer who's never seen it before, you, you kind of have to ask yourself, well, how long would that take to explain that? And how hard would it be? And when, I th when I'm conscious of that while I'm writing code, I tend to find that I uh, write more explicit code. I write clearer code. And it isn't necessarily the amount of lines that it takes, but it's the clarity of it. Um, and how, you know, how much, it, it, what's this t really trying to do? And it helps with my commenting and stuff like that. So I guess the idea is that I need to justify every line. Um, now, I, some people have asked me, well, that means you should write, you know, everything from scratch and you never use libraries or never use, you know, never use anybody else's code. Well, that's absolutely not what I'm talking about. I use tons of code that I didn't write because there are a lot of people who are smarter than me. Um, but, uh, I, and I also, I also use a lot of libraries and tools that are not really trivial to understand um, because I, I don't know a lot about, like, say, encryption. So I use a lot of, you know, for things that are, particularly for things like encryption, you don't want to, I don't try to write my own. I use what somebody else has worked on. Um, uh, lots of things. Um, I've used, you know, I use stuff like, uh, I don't try to write my own framework, uh, like basic framework to do, uh, you know, basic HTTP request routing and stuff like that. I usually use something like Flask, or in PHP I use something like Slim or things like that because I don't really want to have to write that myself again. And then secondly, um, I, it just, they understand those things better than I do in general. But I think that 
the key thing is understanding the responsibility that you take on when you bring code in, and the, particularly the technical debt that you take on. Um, every piece of code that you bring in and all of its, say, requirements and all of its dependencies that you bring in, you're going to be responsible for that as the application developer. And so you're taking on this responsibility and saying, I really need to understand how this stuff works. I need to understand what's going on. I, I, I'm having trouble thinking of a case where I wasn't writing, say, a fairly complex application and I didn't have to, at one point or another, dig into the, uh, to try to figure out, like, how am I going to accomplish this with this tool? Like, even a, a relatively small framework, like, say, Slim or Flask, and I didn't have to dig into it and, like, go into the debugger and test through and see, okay, well, what exactly is it doing here, and why is it setting it like this, and how is it setting this cookie, and understanding that stuff. Every single project I worked on it that was fairly of, of, of a fair size, I ended up having to do that. So you kind of have to become an expert in that, um, and or you have to make sure that you're on the ball for things like, uh, you know, again, keeping up with uh, any fixes, changes, and stuff like that. Just you have to learn that stuff because you're responsible for that as the developer. Um, one of the things we use a lot is Elasticsearch, and we uh, that's it ends up being kind of a black box because we don't have like say a lot of say Java engineers here. It's not like something we could write ourselves necessarily, um, but we're willing to take on that technical debt. Uh, for installing Java and being responsible for maintaining those things and stuff like that. And we do that because it's such a good tool. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't use it. What it means is that we have to understand that responsibility that we take on. Um, and I, I think the, the fourth principle that I try to work with is really creating and using simple readable code. And I, I want code that's easy to understand um, because I think that if you understand things quickly, and you can parse things quickly, uh, it means getting stuff done faster. Uh, your time to productivity is shortened. Uh, your time to fix bugs is shortened. Um, I feel kind of strongly that you don't need, uh, I see you know, developer certification programs and stuff like that that go on. And there's some of that stuff in PHP. Um, there's l less of that in some areas. But I don't really think that you need to be a certified developer. I think what you need to be is a, you need smart, adaptive people and who like learning things and like building things. And um, I, you know, their ability to pick those things up quickly, I think that's what affects your productivity more than anything. And I want code that's easy to verify. I think code should be testable, and I think simpler code is more testable. Now, there's a little bit more to that. I mean, you could do a whole talk on how do you structure code that makes it testable in certain ways and stuff like that. And it's not, it's not an easy thing, but. Um, I think in general, if you have simpler code, it's easier for you to do automated testing on that. Um, and it's easier for you to, again, go through that. And if you have to, say, even step the bug through it or something like that to see what's going on to try to find a bug, it's going to be a lot easier to do that. And I, one thing I, 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 this is probably one of the reasons why I've liked picking up Python is I really feel strongly that readability is a feature. And I feel that the code that I write should be simple and terse, but clear. Basically, like as simple as possible, um, but you know, still maintaining clarity. Um, I really value clarity over cleverness, and I think that's important because I think that makes your code accessible to more people. And I, I think it's a common problem, and I, I can understand sort of the excitement of of of, uh, of making something that's kind of clever and and you know obscure but what works well and hey how much can I get done on like a single line but I don't think that's a particularly effective way to build things um, and it's definitely not an effective way to build things if you're on a team um, chances are your team is going to change you're gonna to have to hire in new people and other and people are going to go away and if they come in uh, the amount of time you have to spend ramping them up is directly going to affect your bottom line. Um, even when it's not necessarily a, a, a money involved, I would consistently see um, a turnover. Uh, when I worked at, at, at Purdue University, and I would sometimes, had a, in, in my role, I would, I would advise groups that were doing, say, building web projects or stuff like that. And a common thing to do was to, build, to bring in students to build stuff. 
And one of the, pr the things that you see in that is you see how much turnover affects stuff and how common it is that you'll just completely lose the thread. Because the thing that you'd, I'd see over and over is that you'd have one or two people, students come in, they'd build something for six months, and then they'd leave. They'd be either by graduating or moving on to something else. And then the next thing that happens is they get two more students who don't understand the code base and feel like they could probably just, instead of spending the time to try to, which may be a lot, to try to get up to speed on it, they would just rewrite it. And the, the, the consequence of that at the end of the road is that um, I guess that's one way of dealing with technical debt, it's just toss everything out, but they never really go anywhere. <laughs> you, you basically, uh, you, you keep writing stuff and you keep tossing it out and you, know, you don't have any uh, sense, uh, you know, these things can't build and there's no maintainability. I, 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 or not maintainability, but there's no consistency between it. I think if you imagine, well, what's gonna happen with my code, say, if it's, this is still being used five years down the road? Are you still gonna be there? I mean, most of the people I know who do development gig, they just switch gigs all the time. Not everybody does. I was at Purdue for nine years. But, but it's common that you'd switch out a lot. Um, so who's going to be maintaining that code five years from now? Especially if you're building something that's not for like, oh, you know, this is some VC funded thing that I'm going to try, to, that they're trying to flip. But something that's actually, you know, trying to maybe help people. It's trying to empower people. Um, I think thinking about that, thinking about who, well, who's going to maintain this now five years down the road? Um, and I, I think that that is, that's stuff that you have to take into account. You have to take that into account. Um, I get, you know, again, uh, will I, even, even not somebody else, am I going to be able to understand my code if I come back to it in two months? I do that all the time where I wrote out tons of code and then I come back to it two months later because somebody found a bug in something. It's like, this doesn't behave this way I'm supposed to. And I have to re-remember why it works the way it does. Um, and there are times where I have uh, had code that I wrote and then said, oh, you know what, I can pull this thing out. And no, I couldn't have pulled that out. That broke something else, right? Which gets into why you should have testing too. But the, uh, the key thing is, again, am I going to be able to understand this code? Um, the less time uh, that you waste trying to figure out how things work, the more time you have for getting stuff done. And no matter what, whether there's, you know, money is on the line, yes or no, or uh, what have you, whatever those consequences are, time is, is like, is the, the one resource we spend on, on every single project we do, profit for profit or not. And uh, that's why I, I, I feel really strongly about that. Well, I'm almost at the end of this talk, so I went fast. Um, now, I have a confession. I don't always follow these rules. And sometimes I get really lazy. I, well, most of the time I get really lazy. And um, a lot of times what I found is that time constraints um, and uh, particularly when you know you have to, you have a business that you have to eat at, and you know that, that, that pays you and stuff like that, and you know you actually have to get stuff done with. Um, I think those time constraints a lot of times mean I write hacky complex code, and it's oftentimes the case that just to understand how things work for me, I tend to write out a very linear, long, you know, series of statements, and then I start breaking that down into smaller pieces. Um, smaller sort of modular pieces, uh, just to make sure, because it's hard for, I haven't quite figured out in my head exactly how the flow is going to work, so it helps me to do that. But a lot of times the problem is I start writing out that thing and it functions and it's, we've got to push this out and the little sort of prototype that you end up thinking that you want to use ends up being the, uh, the thing that gets deployed. Um, I think there's a lot of times I pull in a library and I don't really review it carefully. Um, uh, and, and, and I kind of hope it works. I hope it works out the way it's supposed to. Um, and that's problematic. But at the same time, I guess I've always found that even though it typically takes more time up front to focus on this and write clear, modular, uh, straightforward code, um, I found that it always pays off in the end. Um, it pays off in terms of not just you know stuff that I develop, but but uh, how we work together as a team with the other people who touch it, um, and I, I, so I feel really strongly about that, um, and that's why I feel like I, one of the things that I often see is that um, a lot of folks who they want to get into programming, um, I'll often see get people get pushed into it 
where they'll say, oh, you know what, I kind of want to learn programming. And I'll hear a lot of people say, oh, you should learn Rails. Or you should learn Django, or you should learn something like that. But I do hear a lot of people do say you should say learn Rails, and that comes up a lot. And some of those are I see paid courses where it's like we'll you pay us five thousand dollars, and we'll guarantee you that you can build stuff after this point. Um, and I sort of I understand why people want to do that because it's probably the quickest path to some level of productivity. And I think that, that there's, there's a lot of value to that. Like, really what you're saying is, I don't want to learn how to program. Really it is, is like, I want to build how to learn, build web applications. Um, and if I want to do that, maybe the fastest road to that, to build some kind of web applications to do that by just learning some kind of full stack framework. Um, but I, I, I really think it's problematic if you skip those steps of, I want to learn how to program. Um, I want to learn how, you know, why these things, you know, the basic principles, and this is why it works this way. Because I think if you don't, you end up just sort of rote, it's, it ends up being sort of a series of incantations of, as opposed to understanding, you know, what are, you know, how this stuff works. And I think that's problematic. I think that um, you're going to end up not being as good a developer and you're going to pigeon your hole yourself into, you know, one kind of thing that ends up going away a lot of the time. Um, so yeah, uh, if you're curious, there's a couple things that I wrote that are kind of in, PH, that are in PHP, and um, I think other languages that oftentimes they have better examples for this, but these were a couple things I wrote in PHP. One was a, um, a testing uh, framework that I wrote because the, in PHP, probably the most common, uh, the one that almost everybody knows really is PHP unit, which is a very large, very thick testing framework. And I feel like, well, if you want to write testing, you want to start doing that as fast as possible, and you don't want to have a lot of ramp up to learn how it works, and you don't have to buy books to learn how it works. You should just be able to like say, okay, I write this, there's my test, I ran it, that's fine. It should be like two lines of code. So I wrote a little thing, it's not necessarily the best thing in the world, but it's a simple unit testing framework I called FUnit. Um, and then another thing I wrote is um, a thing called resty.php, which is a, uh, it's basically a, a real simple HTTP client for sort of in, the idea is that you're interacting with HTTP APIs. Um, and uh, the reason I like it is because uh, we had to, uh, we didn't want to write stuff against the curl API, which if you're familiar with that in PHP, is, it's commonly installed, but um, the API for it, for the library, I think is really bad. Um, and uh, I just wanted something simple and straightforward that was going to do what I wanted. And uh, there wasn't much available at the time. So we wrote that for, uh, for a project we were working on. So those are a couple of things you can look at, kind of get an idea for it. Um, I'm basically at the end. <laughs> uh, I think I went a little fast. But uh, I'd like to hear questions or, or discussion I, you know, things that if you have or if you don't, that's OK, too. Please go ahead. Right. Where you have a comment that explains how the language works. Right. And then sort of like the simplest, most approachable feature of the language that does this, and you do, do you know, 10 lines of, of code for what a, a more advanced use of the same language would be one line. Right. So, but to repeat the question for the recording, um, I hope I get it right, is that, uh, that particularly for, as you, from when you're beginning learning a language uh, and as you sort of, uh, I guess you'd say, ramp up and become more comfortable with it, sort of what you view as readable changes um, and, and, and how you d define readability. And I think that's true. I remember when I was first writing a more complex Python application. I had written a few, a couple like tiny scripts, but I was writing a more complex Python web application. And I found myself making notes so that I understood what was going on here. Like, this statement is doing this. It's pulling in this module, and it's located over here, you know, I, because I didn't understand really how the module system worked. Um, and I had to write that stuff out so that I had that clarity. And somebody who's familiar with it certainly wouldn't need something like that. Um, I, uh, so I think, that, I think that differs to some extent. I, I think that, 
Uh, it's also the case that, and I think this is where you see maybe some, sometimes you see a certain, like a little amount of sneering uh, towards uh, uh, folks who, who like, like I tend to try to sort of be explicit about what's going on and I prefer explicitness in my code. Um, that explains what it's doing, hopefully, in the statements that I've written. Um, I think that, uh, I think some folks, they say, well, I'm familiar with it, and I'm comfortable with it, so that's cool. And I, I had a, I, I wish I had this example, but there was a friend of mine who I did, I was on a dev team with, and he would write the most esoteric, like, sort of, he was writing, I think it was some command line scripts, and he basically, he wrote, like, his own little, uh, domain specific language in PHP for like uh, the, or that PHP would interpret that with its own syntax to run a bunch of things and it was to him it made sense I would say that hit one I think what made sense to him doesn't necessarily it didn't make sense to the rest of us and it was very very complex and it was an extreme example where it was like let's jam as much stuff onto one line as possible where it's like there's no white space and it was you know but it made sense to him um, I suppose there's some threshold there uh, where, and there's smarter people than me who are gonna, who are gonna talk about this, that um, we agree that this code is more readable and less readable. I also think that it varies from person to person, but I think that it helps a lot to implement code standards and kind of focus on, I, I, I generally feel that, I wish I had a good example of this, but I generally feel that uh, if you imagine other team members work, who are working on it and having, uh, that, kind of going back to that, imagine it, having to explain it to somebody else and, um, or actually going through that process and like sitting down with them and explaining it to them, I think that gives you some good insights into, well, is what I'm writing here, is that really the obvious or is it not? Um, one thing that I, like an example, and some people are very comfortable with the ternary operator, you know, in various languages. I've never been comfortable with the ternary operator. It doesn't, when I look at it, it doesn't read right to me, and I have to think very carefully what's going on each time. So I tend to avoid using that. I'm much more comfortable with like a, a standard like if-else construct for that reason. Um, so like in that case, my, you know, part of that's uh, certainly my bias. I would tend to, like if I were setting up, you know, uh, I guess uh, coding standards for, for a team, I would say really try to avoid the ternary operator unless there's some really good reason for doing it. Um, but that would be an example of something where, I know how it works, but I just always struggle with that. And I feel like, I feel like it's just hard to read. But I don't know, it does vary from person to person. Um, but my, I guess, yeah, my feeling is that there's some sort of a base level of stuff that I think it, where it works better and, and, and a, a certain things you try to avoid. Did that answer your question at all? It's a, it's a tough question. Yeah, it is. The, the thing that I, like, I've kind of gotten where if I'm, you know, I, actually I just don't write comments in the code unless yeah. there's some reason that it's not, like, it, the comments that I write are, Yep. Right. Yeah, and I think it I think it varies because it's not it's not always just the language, it's the ecosystem, it's the tools and things like that, and that varies from language to language. And what's sort of uh, I think, I, I, I think that there's always a tendency that people tend to prefer the languages they know and I think, or I, they'll often say, well, I don't like that because, and they'll criticize some aspect of it. Like, you know, with PHP, I'll hear a lot of people criticize meaningful namespace in, um, in Python. Um, but I really think that most of what that has to do with is my brain is used to reading 
is used to parsing this and understands how to parse this, and I can glance at it and kind of get what's going on. So that when I go to something that has a, a different syntax that's different enough where I'm not comfortable anymore, now that seems wrong to me. And I think that that's always going to be a tendency when, especially if you're not really comfortable with the language. Um, I know I have that problem with Objective-C. I don't like Objective-C, and I don't want to dive into it because I find it really obtuse looking. And I just don't like it. It looks alien to me, um, the way that it mixes things up. And I, I, I don't like it. And, um, but I bet if somebody said, well, uh, for the next year, you're going to have to write Objective-C. I'm probably going to learn it. And, I'm gonna, and there's, there's a certain level of you have to understand kind of what the syntax means. I guess it's, it's judging like, well, how common is this? There's some, there's some constructs that are common that if you have any business saying, yeah, I can code some in this language. I should be able to figure that out, like a switch statement or you know, things like that. Yep. Yes. And that's why every time I'm talking to colleagues and show them something in a strange language like Clojure, yep. uh, they look at it and go, oh, that looks so alien, I'm not even going to bother. I right. don't care how good it is, I don't care what other advantages it may or may not have. Yep. Uh, yep. Yeah, well, I think it's a good comment, and it's a good thing to keep in mind. I, it, 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 it's, um, you know, and to repeat again for what you said, was that, that most languages kind of look like C, and the things that we're going to be comfortable with is C, because that's what most people have sort of started from, and, and so languages that developed out of that tend to look fairly similar to that. And when we look at something that just at first glance looks alien and we don't understand how, how it works at first glance, that's really problematic. Um, and they, they're kind of like, oh, I don't like that. Well, and I could kind of dig that, but, um, so I think there's a practical aspect. You have to think about, well, what am I trying to accomplish? Like, am I gonna write something in the next four weeks? Well, maybe I don't wanna pill in, uh, say, a language that, 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 that folks don't understand. And the same way, you know, there's gonna be variants where, uh, you have to, again, you have to consider, all this stuff really comes down to being pragmatic about things. If you come, if your team is really familiar with, say, doing Django apps, and you guys, and, and hopefully, you know, you know, the people on your team know Django in and out. Well, uh, I wouldn't advise if you want to spin up something, like, fairly quickly, you decide, you know what, we're going to write this in, I don't know, uh, pylons or something like that. Because, I. Uh, you have to consider the expertise you have in house, and and it, you're all, you know, speaking the same language, not just programming language, but you all have the understanding of that expertise there. Um, so you're going to be more comfortable with that technical debt, and that technical debt isn't going to weigh as much because it, you guys all have, you know, are, are are comfortable with that and feel strong about in, in that area. But um, if you pull in something else that's new that you're not familiar with, well, you have to be prepared to kind of pull that in, and again. Take that on. Be responsible for that, and, uh, and 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 if it's not a good idea, you shouldn't do it, right? Um, yeah. So, any other questions, comments, anything like that? Hey, yeah, please. On the, uh, readability, yeah. Um, what I found worked best is like try to do code review stuff, but I learned more from that than trying to like imagine what I think makes sense. Oh yeah. Yeah, so the first thing I'll say, oh, I'm sorry, I, I interrupted you. Um, to, to repeat, I'd say that you, that you, you said that, that code reviewing has been really valuable for you uh, rather than sort of like guessing at what's effective. You learn a lot about what really, what really is you know, comprehensible for other people. So, and first off, I totally agree with that. Um, I think that gives you immediate feedback. So I really feel strongly like code reviews on in, in team uh, uh, flows really help a lot, and I'd say, you know, the say Git model of like pull requests and doing code reviews before you merge that stuff in. I think that's really effective. But however you do your code reviews, I think that's really really good um, because just getting a second set of eyes on it to say, hey, yeah, I don't I don't get what's going on here. Or what's helped me a lot is getting somebody who knows this stuff better than I do, especially when I'm sort of ramping up and trying to trying to get with it. Uh, who can say, yeah, you can do it like this, but you know what would be simpler if you just did and that's, oh, okay, yeah. And um, 
and, and my my and that helps me a lot in just in terms of just learning stuff um, uh, because a lot of times you just don't know the language as well as you, you'd like to. Um, but uh, the thing, so yes, I think code reviews are really, really effective in that, in that area. So, yes. Anything else? All right, well, thanks for coming. I appreciate it.